this country is at war with Germany. With Germany. We shall go on to the end. I remember the sheets of flame which came up and almost blinded us from our guns. The Indian Army was the largest volunteer army during the Second World War. Indian Army divisions fought in the Middle East, North Africa and Italy and went and went to make up the overwhelming majority of the troops in Southeast Asia. Over 2 million personnel served in the Indian Army. I'm Angus Wallace and in this episode I'm joined by Alan Jeffries to discuss how the Indian Army developed a more comprehensive training structure than any other Commonwealth country during World War II. This was achieved through both the dissemination of doctrine and professionalism of a small cadre of Indian Army officers who brought about a military culture within the Indian Army starting in the 1930s. That came to fruition during World War II. Alan is the Head of Equipment and Uniform at the National Army Museum in London and the author of Approach to Battle, Training the Indian Army During the Second World War. Well, thanks for joining me. I thought we'd start with the First World War. Had the war radically changed the Indian Army? Because they'd seen action all over the world. Yeah, obviously, for the Indian Army in the First World War fought across the globe. And um, and I think, you know, by 1918, a very impressive army that, uh, you know, was fighting along the same lines as the British Army and all the Commonwealth armies by 1918, especially in the Palestine campaign. But one of the huge problems, I think, is because the Indian Army is organised at that time in individual regiments. So regiments were, you know, reinforcing, recruiting and training in sort of isolation uh, during the um, First World War. I mean, sometimes three regiments together would use the same depot and that kind of thing. So it wasn't totally in isolation, but it certainly became, a, you know, an issue throughout the, the um, First World War. Because, you know, prior to that, you know, the fighting on the sort of northwest frontier, you know, there's not such a high um, number of casualties. So that isn't is isn't an is, issue until you know they fight in a sort of global conventional war. And so after the war, there's um there is a report, the Isha report, and one of the things they um, recommend is that uh, the the regimental system adapts, uh, and, and basically along the lines of the British Army. So they have these super regiments. And so for example, you had in the First World War, you had the Fourteenth Sikhs, they fight at Gallipoli. And then in 1922, they become the first battalion of the 10th Sikhs. I think it was 11 Sikhs. So you'll have a number of battalions within a regiment. And also within that regiment, there'll be a training battalion. The 10th battalion will be a training battalion, which um, that doesn't come from the British Army then. Whereas the um, the kind of super regiment idea does, um, is, is sort of adapted from from the British Army. And that sort of continues until... Until 1947. Is, is that essentially changing the Indian Army from sort of an internal security and sort of policing frontiers? Is that getting it set up coming out of the First World War to be if it ever needs to become something different into a more conventional force? Or do they just reorganise it because they feel it needed a bit of a shake-up coming out of the First World War? I think it definitely needed um, the reorganisation. However, I think gen- generally in the interwar period, they, they sort of returned to that imperial policing role on the Northwest Front. And internal security, aid to civil power, the two main roles in the Indian Army. I mean, it's expanded a bit. I mean, for instance, there's on the northeast frontier of India. And then in the late 30s, um, Indian Army battalions do go further afield, like um, the Malaya. So there's this generational tradition of families sending their sons into the Indian Army. And that, that is both British and Indian from an institutional perspective, is that help or a hindrance? Oh, well, I think I think it's a help, um, certainly for recruitment sort of thing. So um, John Masters, who wrote some rather good m- memoirs, um, wrote past Mandalay and a particularly good one on his interwar service with the Gurkhas. I think he was the fifth generation of his family to serve in India. And then for Indian soldiers, and, and, uh, and I understand it continues today, you know, generations will, will, will serve, especially from the Punjab region. So apart from during the World Wars, the Indian Army from the sort of 1860s onwards were heavily recruited from the Punjab region. And so generations from there um, have, have served in the Indian Army, you know, right up until the present day. Does it not create some sort of stagnation though, if you're getting the same sort of family tradition officers coming in? I, I can see it almost from both sides. Presumably one, one you, you get officers coming in who are more culturally aware, presumably, though that might not always be a good thing. 
But does that not also breed the same point? You're not getting fresh blood through that helps it revigorate, revigorate, uh, revigorize. I'm not sure that's a word. <laughs> revigorate the thinking. The, I suppose the big changes come during the, the world wars. Um, so a lot of people who have been conscripted become officers, say, in the Indian Army and have completely different views on w- what should be happening in India. Um, I suppose that definitely mixes things up a bit. And within India itself, soldiers are recruited from across India during the world wars, which um, doesn't really happen so much pre and, and, and interwar period. But saying that, <laughs> in the Second World War, for example, most of the soldiers, Indian soldiers who are fighting uh, even, you know, in 1944-45 in the Burma campaign, are still largely the ones, you know, recruited from the Punjab. Uh, uh, so a, a lot of um, the soldiers from southern India, for example, end up, you know, uh, in the Royal Indian Army Service Corps and that kind of thing. But that, that, I mean, that's a, not too much of a generalisation. There are um, there are sort of new regiments formed during the Second World War as well from across India. It is a professional, it's, it is a very professional army. It has its own staff college at Quetta, which I was aware of, but I hadn't realised it's how old it was. Does that mirror the one in England? Are they are they doing the same courses, or are they doing something regionally diff, regionally specific, even for what for their own needs? So it does mirror um, Gamaly, with the exception of there'll be slightly more emphasis on internal security and fighting on the northwest frontier. However, even at Camberley, there'll always be an Indian Army officer teaching those at Camberley as well. So it's pretty much the same course. The Indian Military Academy is set up in the early 1930s, and that mirrors the well, for Indian officers, and that, and that mirrors uh, Sandhurst, except that it's the course is slightly longer, um, which is one of the only sort of differences. And I mean, and and anecdotally, people say that it was uh, more slightly more professional, um, and, and do more on um, tactics and training than perhaps Sandhurst would have done it at, at the same period. Generally, when you read sort of memoirs of British Indian officers, they're found at Sandhurst, you know, it's all the funny stories. Um, it's not really um, much on um, uh, the detail, whereas um, I, I think that's not quite the case at the Indian Military Academy in the in the 1930s. I mean, they went out play, uh, fox hunting every afternoon as their uh, exercise they were doing. No, no, they, yeah. They, I mean, obviously, there's they, 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 there's an element of that, but um, I, I just don't think to, to quite the same extent as say that happened at Sandhurst in the 30s. Does that work then to standardise? If you, if the officers are going to a staff college, does that mean the Indian Army is, is operating as a, a modern British, a modern British, a modern fighting force co- you know, comparable to say the British Army, is it? Are we looking at the same sort of standards? Yeah, very much so. And um, people like um, uh, Montgomery, Montgomery teachers in Quetta, and Bill Slim, Bill Slim teaches at camp in, in the um, in the interwar period. So yeah, very similar level. And even the, I think the British Army in that period is is uh, 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 very much um, uh, centre on imperial policing. But I noticed when looking at training in the thirties, so. In India, even though there is this concentration on the North West Frontier, for example, for the various exams and that kind of thing, and um, they do training memoranda, a lot of the lessons learned are from the First World War, for example. And so officers look at, um, you know, the Gallipoli campaign or the Mesopotamian campaign, and it changes on a yearly basis. And this happens in, in, in India and in the, uh, uh, in the Indian and the British Army. I'm assuming in the Indian Army's funded from London or at least partly funded from London, does it suffer financial restraints in the 20s and 30s that affects its its you know, training? Presumably, it's usually the large-scale manoeuvres and things like that, they get cut back. The Indian Army is funded by the colonial government in India, so it's for India, with the exceptions of during the World Wars, where then, then, then if it's fighting outside India, it is funded by the um, British government. Um, there are the same issues in the 30s as, uh, as there are with the, with the British Army. There is a lack of funding for for the army generally across the board. And, uh, you know, with the British Army in that period, uh, you know, mechan- mechanisation goes forward to an extent. Well, it, it, it goes to an even lesser extent in it happens in India before the um, uh, Second World War. But it is it does start. It, it has begun. But um, but, yeah, just the, the lack of um, lack of equipment, lack of funding. But that's sort of just about put in place at the beginning of the um, Second World War. There's a various commissions. The Chatfield Commission is is one, and it's um, General Orkinleck instrumental in that process. Uh, and to put in the Indian Army on a, a more of a a wartime footing. 
or, or would it ultimately become um, more of a wartime footing? What's the split with the officers? Are, are the officers British and the NCOs Indian? Is that how it functions or do they have a number of uh, Indian officers as well? Oh, is that, my, my question ultimately is going to be, <laughs> so we get there, yeah, it, how many people from Britain are wanting to join the Indian Army? Or is it a career backwater? But I wasn't. I was unsure of how many officers at the Indian Army required, sort of, say from from the UK. I think in the twenties and thirties, British officers weren't quite so keen to join the Indian Army because, as a career, it didn't look as if it was going to last too long. Because obviously, the the, the movement for independence. But again, that doesn't necessarily prevent British officers from um, joining the Indian Army. Um, in the thirties onwards, Indian officers are um, trained at the Indian Military Academy. However, by 1939, there was only about 400 Indian officers in the Indian Army, and the vast majority are British officers, I think roughly about 2,000. But obviously, that's accelerated during the Second World War. So it's, I mean, there's, I think it's just over 15,000 Indian officers by 1945, and around 30,000 British officers. And then the the other thing to say is, in the Indian Army, there's a, a, a unique sort of, rank system where they have viceroy commissioned officers and they're the vital link between the soldiers and the British officers. And they remain. I mean, they're still in the Indian Army today. They're called junior officers. And so they're very important as well. And certainly in the 20s and 30s, there's that um, competition between these newly commissioned Indian officers and the old school viceroy commissioned officers, quite often, um, uh, 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 and that rivalry at the quite often at the expense of each other as well. But Indianization is basically stopped at the beginning of the Second World War, basically because of um, the need for officers generally. The Indianization was whereby certain battalions within the Indian Army were just solely officered by Indian officers, and the British officers would be in other other battalions. A system that didn't really work very well, and um, and a number of people criticised it, including um, Auchinleck, even at the time. I assume when the army rap- rapidly expands, the British army is rapidly expanding, and so everyone is fighting over the same pool of people in Britain for officers, uh, which must be difficult. Then, how who do you choose to send to India or accept into the Indian army, or, or you know, as opposed to the British army, which can't have helped. And also, the expansion in the Indian army starts slightly later, not until the f- nineteen forty. Just as um, uh, the, I think the priority is more in the British Army at the time, 4th Indian Division, for example, goes to North Africa quite quickly. And then there's Indian troops in the Middle East. But it, they aren't seen as um, as a top priority. So expansion is, de- is delayed. And when it does come, one of the major issues is that the system can't cope with it. So there's a, la- a severe lack of training. So you get Indian battalions who go out to Malaya, for example, in 1941, some of them have had a even very little basic training, let alone any other sort of training. And and then there are formations who've gone out to both Malaya and Burma who have had a little bit of training for the, the Middle East because that's where they were expected to go, but absolutely nothing for, say, jungle warfare. So that was one of the huge problems of expansion. And it's only really when the expansion of the Indian Army s- sort of stops in 1943 that the emphasis of training, doctrine, all these sort of things uh, becomes much more apparent and, and much more important because uh, up until then, they're quite often just coping with the uh, with the um, over-expansion of the, of the Indian Army in such a short space of time. It's a funny one because they don't really expand until, I guess it's the fall of France must be the trigger, but yet they're, they're fir- what, they very quickly declare war on Germany and then do nothing. It's, is, is it the fall of France mid, mid to late 40 that they... they yeah, 1940, yeah, expand, definitely. Which is, it, which is an odd one. And then they don't... Whereas if, I was, I'm drawing comparable to Britain, where Britain has already brought in... I was going to say subscription. I didn't mean subscription, I mean conscription. It, it was brought in before the war. In some respects, the Indian Army must have been able to control its expansion by the fact that it's a volunteer army, you can send people away or put them on lists or change your criteria for bringing bringing them in. So when they're expanding, are they expanding thinking, because Japan's not necessarily seen as a threat in 1940. So I, I assume they're expanding thinking that the Indian army will be looking west, in which case are they gearing any thought process for training, what training they're getting to send people sort of to the Middle East and North Africa? No, no, definitely. So um, just to talk about one character, individual, um, 
Francis Tuca, Gertie Tuca. He trains his battalion, 1st Battalion, 2nd uh, second Gurkhas, to a very high level in the 30s. And I think um, his, his ideas sort of permeate throughout India in the late 1930s. And as a result, he becomes Director of Military Training in about 1940, he um, he builds up the department. It has much more importance. Um, for example, the, uh, the original DMT would be a brigadier. Well, under Tuka is a major general. The department increases in size. They're responsible for all the training establishments, all the doctrine. But and and under his um, direction, they put forward a doctrine for jungle warfare, mountain warfare. He goes on a massive tour of the Middle East as well, uh, as well as the usual Northwest Frontier. So there's a doctrine, a sort of finalised doctrine for that, and also a finalised doctrine for um, aid to civil war. And these all come out under his um, his sort of control of um, the, the military training directorate. That's a centralised uh, doctrine for various theatres of warfare. But what I find interesting is that Indian 1st Division is issuing its own training instructions. And I didn't realise that they would be in, I, I, issuing... You know, their own. I thought they'd be more centralised. The issuing of manuals and pamphlets and things like that. And that's for. And it was interesting. It's focused on decentralisation command, which I thought was interesting as well. Which I didn't really expect. I don't know why. It's ignorance from the Indian Army, which I thought was an interesting point. So the doctrine comes century through the military training directory, but it both a top down and a bottom up process as well. I'd say definitely by 43 and perhaps even before, it didn't matter sort of which theatre an Indian Army was, division was fighting and they were all producing training instructions and learning the lessons. So it happens later in Italy, certainly happening in North Africa because Tuca goes on to command 4th Indian Division in North Africa. And as soon as he goes goes there, he starts issuing training instructions. But he's not the only one. 5th Indian Division under uh, Major Briggs issued them. Um, even in Malaya, I think 9th Indian Division, they're issuing training instructions um, quite early on. But by 43, this is this is pretty much across the board. These training instructions, they then inform um, or help inform the revised doctrine that's coming out from Military Training Directorate in um, Delhi, in GHQ India. Um, so it's, it's both a top-down and, um, and a bottom-up process. Uh, the issue of training instructions um, is quite interesting because this doesn't uh, – there's, well, there's two, actually two things I want to say. So field service regulations is the common doctrine across all British and Commonwealth armies. But as as a number of people have said, you know, it was quite vague. It wasn't much. For example, there was like two pages on jungle warfare and very vague indeed, not that helpful. So these um, extra pamphlets are meant to help specifically on, say, jungle warfare or, or, or something like that. If all these units are producing their own pamphlets, they're getting fed back centrally. Yeah, so the pamphlets, um, the training pamphlets are done centrally. The training instructions, so just like um, they'd just be like a, you know, like a five-page instruction after, after a campaign or something like that in Italy or or North Africa, just on the lessons that were learned from from their actions. So Eighth Indian Division, for example, in in, in the Italian campaign under General uh, Major General Russell, he as soon as he becomes a, a commander of the Fourth Indian Division, he'd actually served under Tuka in fourth indian so he he uses the same sort of um uses training instructions those training instructions especially when they were training in the middle east before they go to italy are based on british and indian army training pamphlets you know published ones and this 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 happens all across uh, indian army divisions but at the same time i don't think it happens so much in the british army so i have seen training instructions in the indian army uh, in the british army sorry but um not many i mean i've seen them for armored formations in Northwest Europe in 1944-45. And there's also, there is an army training memorandum, British army training memorandum, published by the War Office, actually forbidding British formations from issuing training instructions. Well, early on this is, this is sort of 1940-41. There's a different sort of um, uh, uh, culture, even though, you know, both British and Indian army officers would have both gone to Quetta and Camberley to do the staff course, but it's quite interesting that the Indian Army really takes on this sort of what, what I've called like, um, you know, becomes a learning institution and they really take this on. And I, and I assume some of it stems from some staff college, whereas the British Army, you know, in 40, 40, 41 actually um, have, are forbidden to issue training instructions. You know, it's very much centralised, I think. Well, I think that was, you know, that that's what struck me when you know, they're issuing the, you know, focused on decentralisation of command. And I'm suddenly thinking, hang on, this is, 
decentralization of command or uh, of command commanders having understudies which i could see being linked to the first world war and the, you know towards the end of the first world war but then it got me thinking but the unit itself is producing its own training manuals which is itself a decentralization i couldn't quite see that as you say happening in the in the british army which tends to be much more uh, linear sort of command line really <laughs> doesn't necessarily have that this feedback loop so i'm fascinated by the manual so the, the each each uh, manual that gets produced feeds back and is there a central organization then that then goes through them all and picks out all the relevant bits that everyone's talking about to produce then an updated doctrine from all the manuals produced yeah so so i mean i'm, I'm showing you this but obviously military training pamphlet number nine in india so this is august 1942 but this is the third edition august 42 so the first edition was the one that was sent was written by tuka sent out malaya mtp number nine well, the, one of the problems with that, it was sent out in, um, I think, late 41. And I just don't know how, how widely read it was. Then it's um, the second edition is written after Malaya. Third edition, this one, is written after the retreat from Burma. And is that printed, not typed? So it's actually quite, it's not like great big... Printed and um, and published. So that's quite a big, that, what's that, 60, 70 pages? MTP number nine, the first edition, I think it was 11 pages. And this is the third edition, and this is 73 pages by now. And when 5th Indian Division, because they, they fight out in North Africa, the Middle East, but they come back to India in 1943 uh, to retrain, retrain for jungle warfare, and they, they use this jungle warfare, and they, they call it the Bible for uh, jungle warfare tactics. And then ultimately, the fourth edition comes out. It's called the Jungle Book. I don't have a copy to show you, unfortunately, but it's got like um, cartoons in pictures for the first time to make training more appealing. And also it comes out after the first Arakan when it, when uh, British and Commonwealth troops come across up against Japanese um, defensive bunkers for the first time. And obviously have a, you know, first Arakan is, is even more disastrous than, than the retreat from Burma and, and, and Malaya. So, and I think the jungle book is, 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 is essential. It's really sort of essential doctrine that shows how far jungle warfare had come in that short period of time and then later forms the basis of of two war office uh british war office manuals that were going to be issued to the british liberation army you know which they, i think they they nicknamed burma looms ahead don't they if the war had continued after you know after they've been fighting in, in northwest europe and then they um a, a lot of the british army would have had to actually um perhaps come out to um to burma to uh, fight the japanese so you end up getting four editions of MTP number nine. And in, in that particular aspect, the Indian Army pioneers jungle warfare doctrine then is um, uh, used, for example, by the British office with their training pamphlets, which come out in 1944-45, I think. Yes, almost horse-bolted by that time, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So they come out, but I don't think they're, they're little used. I mean, I assume they're probably used in the UK at the time, you know, for uh, people thinking they might have to go out to Burma. But, um, you know, fortunately, never any... Really had to happen who is reading those training manuals it's 70 pages it's quite a hefty uh who's the issue to they are issued widely by 1945 i think there's 75 training establishments there is a training division specifically for jungle warfare two of them and they're mainly for indian troops but there's also a brigade who um train british uh, troops um i think it's 57 brigade uh, so these are the new recruits coming out from britain to uh, be instructed in in, in jungle warfare in the Indian training divisions, um, so an Indian recruit would go to the regimental training centre for basic training and then would spend two months with the training divisions. Then they would go to a reinforcement camp, training would continue, and then they'd join their um, unit or battalion. And these training pamphlets would inform the training at all of those uh, places. It would be available there as well. And for the Indian troops, I mean, they, they, a lot of training pamphlets were written in sort of in um, Roman script Urdu as well. At the same time, I mean, even from the twenties onwards, um, there's a there was a big sort of impetus on education of Indian troops as well. You know, and and it's seen as quite necessary. You know, especially for things like uh, mechanisation, that kind of thing. You know, similar to, similar to the British. Yes, well, presumably you're starting to put people into trucks. You're from a country that doesn't necessarily have a lot of trucks. It's a you, you've got to get them started. It's a low, low, low bar that you're working from. How big is it? Is, I, I've completely forgotten, and I didn't note it down how big the Indian Army was. But the I think that at, at its biggest, it's two point three million, and I 
I think that might be in 45 or maybe slightly earlier. That's the biggest. And then I think by 1945, it's sort of down to 2 million. It's absolutely immense. So is India just full of huge training bases dotted all over? Yeah, so there's 75 training establishments across India, but they're not necessarily doing jungle warfare. There's combined operations training going on, open warfare, which is obviously very useful for the open plains for the later parts of the Burma campaign, for example, combined operations, obviously for Operation Zipper going into Malaya, that doesn't doesn't go ahead. Air operations training, mountain warfare as well, because obviously um, Indian um, soldiers are still going out to the Italian campaign, and and at the same time there are units based still on the northwest front throughout the Second World War, and then. Um, and internal security. So um, a number of uh, training subjects. And then obviously the basic training for so soldiers who would be trained at um, the regimental training centres, which are across India, a large number of those. And then officers in the Second World War were trained at the Indian Military Academy, but also there were three officer training schools set up as well in various parts of India, um, Amau, uh, Bangalore, and another place which can't think of what my head that system is um is based on, on a similar system existed in the first world war and it's just uh, increased to another level in the second world war was actually training in india rather than you know sandhurst and going out to india it's funny you mentioned the mountain trips i'd be thinking uh, this is p- p- probably beyond the scope of your book directly but i wondered if india actually had a a, a, a cadre of uh of specialized mountain troops which the british british didn't have for the simple reason that India had mountains and Britain does not. So, so when it gets to these places with mountains, you know, Italy and uh, uh, and uh, yes, it's Tunisia, and they actually can produce troops that British just that Britain just doesn't have experience with. Very much so. So even for the Norway campaign, I think 20, 20 Indian officers go out as advisors for Norway, and Orkinlex out there as well, and he he's obviously um. Very much an expert mountain warfare. There's a mountain warfare training school in the Middle East. In 1943, it's run by Major General Holworthy, who goes on to command 4th Indian Division in the Italian campaign. So, yeah, there's a lot of mountain warfare um, experience. And also, the other one to talk about very quickly is the Battle of Turin, or Battle of Turin, I never know how you pronounce it, in um, in East Africa. 4th and 5th Indian Division are actually fighting together, which is quite rare early on. And um, uh, and there's a lot of mountain warfare experience yeah, just from that from from, from that experience because generally in north africa the fourth fifth i think tenth indian division are there for a bit but um, they seem to be broken up a lot into brigades and and fighting they very rarely fight as a as a division in, in north africa but that does happen in italy and it does happen in, in east africa presumably they don't have the political clout the indians that some of the dominions have to force britain to make them fight together i think that's definitely one of the major reasons and certainly Tuka is um he complains about it wholeheartedly to uh, the commander in chief India at the time you know um, that his his uh, division keeps on getting broken up and um, fighting as individual brigades but what's quite interesting from a training point of view so if the, when the brigades are fighting separately they're producing training instructions and and learning the lessons and sometimes even down to battalion level now uh, this you know in Italy North Africa and and in Burma as well We're going to take a short break. We'll be back with you in a moment. Welcome back. I'm talking to Alan Jeffries about training the Indian Army. There's an ideological idea that I had that the British Army are compelled to fight. The British soldier is a conscript. The Indian Army soldier is a volunteer. And I wonder if that affects their standard of training uh, when they arrive, I was going to say the land, but I don't, I don't think that's that's particularly fair, and it's probably counter to what people would like to believe during the the, the war. But uh, are they arriving similarly trained? I think one of the things is there's a there's a tradition of using a battle drill where you train to a, such a high level that actions become automatic in battle, and that there is this tradition in in the Indian Army, and I think that's not so much the case in the British Army. However, saying that, the British Army. In especially the one that fights in Northwest Europe has been training for a good couple of years. You know, depending on your point of view, I I, I would say it was pretty well trained, but academics, some academics have said not, and and obviously Montgomery thinks you know they've got the training wrong in in in, in the UK. You know, but I would have said pretty well trained, but yeah, different and a difficult difficult to compare as well. I think as well, you know, 
because you know when when i first started um looking at this i thought oh yeah indian army you know much more professional that kind of thing but uh, it's just different i think that's really you're talking about two different armies where second world War british army is um a conscript army and and certainly for those conscripts who go out to india and join as as british officers you know a lot of them are not that uh, you know very unimpressed with you know what's going on in colonial india at the time very very different attitudes i think and and difficult to compare the two armies both were ultimately successful uh, i think the the makeup of the armies and their traditions and their cultures are different um, one of the things that some um, historians have said particularly um, uh, Raymond Callahan has said that then from 1943 with the Indian Army, those in charge of the Indian Army, like General Bill Slim, General Walkinlack, uh, and a whole range of divisional commanders, Major General Savory, who becomes Director of Infantry, they're all Indian Army officers. Um, so they kind of know the ways and traditions of the Army, whereas to compare it with the First World War in 1916, General Monroe becomes CNC India. And he brings a lot of British service officers with him who who do um, make a big, you know, they have a, um, have a dramatic event of, uh, effect on the Indian Army at the time. But they're all British service. Whereas in, in 43, they're, they're, it's all Indian Army officers that sort of start this transformation of the army. It's funny because I, I, I got thinking about the push and pull of the Indian Army in North Africa when you get the Ork and Lick in and people out. And the, and the way Ork, the Ork brings over people and then they're all flushed out again as the British army takes control and you kind of get this seesawing of different views on how it, it's all meant to work and then obviously Monty arrives who's the only person who ever does anything right it's Monty you know the, the only well-trained army would be the one trained by him and um yeah I suppose there's always that element of um commanding officers bringing their sort of entourage with them I suppose for want of a better term because um the, the best example in India is when General Lees goes out there and he brings a lot of his um, Eighth Army officers with him, and obviously this doesn't go down well with uh, Indian Army officers, and especially those who'd been in Fourteenth Army. And ultimately, you know, uh, at least is that doesn't do very well out in, in India, and has to come home, and and Slim takes over. Well, I was thinking, and I might be wrong here. I was thinking about Dorman Smith Chink going the opposite direction, and everybody absolutely hating him in the desert. <laughs> well, I, th- I keep feeling he's quite an abrasive character. But I always feel sorry for um, Tom Corbett actually because. His papers are um, at Cambridge um, Churchill College archives, and I, I've been through them. and um, And he trains up the armoured formations in in India really well, and then obviously goes to North Africa with with Orkin, with uh, Dorman Smith and uh, various others. And 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 obviously, when the purge comes, you know they don't really have they don't get field positions again. Apart from Orkin, who obviously comes, he sort of goes back to becoming CNC India that time of his career 43 to 45 well actually later 46 is quite forgotten but in a way that's probably the, the most important part of his career he's responsible for overseeing the army to to be on a wartime fitting for the burma campaign and then even you know through all the troubles in 46 and 47 with um uh, independence and partition and that's i think is is all connects last and legacy rather than anything that happened earlier but you mentioned before uh the idea of battle drill which i i picked which i thought was interesting so the military the Indian Army like battle drill, and the British Army don't. Why, why, why does one like it and one not? Is is this an institutional difference? I'm not sure actually, um, but it, there's definitely a tradition in the Indian Army, and it's you know been going on for fighting on the northwest frontier very much prior to the Second World War, for example. But it doesn't seem to be as popular in in the British Army. Why? I'm not sure. I have to say. I don't know, is it stifle initiative or does it make people automata? Does it make them? Well, it's funny because um, I, I don't think it stifles initiative because obviously that that period in the interwar period and certainly during the Second World War, you know, um, initiative is definitely not stifled in the Indian Army. You know, there's a much de- decentralization of of command and control in the Burma campaign in the Northwest Frontier. That kind of thing kind of just continues, whereas um, yeah, my understanding, and again, I'm not so good on the on the British Army, my understanding. Of the uh, uh, of the British Army is that um, it's more centralisation rather than decentralisation of, um, uh, of of command and control. So it's less initiative by um, by say junior British officers, junior officers in the British Army. Sorry, at the end of the war, uh, you've already mentioned Orkinlex, you know, creating an Indian Indian Army, very much creating an Indian Army, I guess, for independence for independent India. Is it a very distinctive Indian Army? 
at the end of the war? Is it is it a uniquely Indian institution? It, more, much more so than prior, because I think there is there was that um, emphasis on education. Um, they had like uh, groups where um, you know, like within the British Army, they've got ABCA, the um, education of all British soldiers and officers. Well, that happens. That also happens in India. So a lot of the same pamphlets are um, produced in India. There are discussion groups that are going on, um, that kind of thing. So there's much more of um, a wider Indian army, I think, in 45 than there would have been, you know, than 1939, recruited from across India, very much um, aware of the politics that's going on, the road for independence uh, and that kind of thing. But at the same time, it's known that, you know, an army is still would still be essential after independence. And obviously, there's a large number of Indian officers by 1945 who 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 can who can step up. But even by 1945, you know, the highest ranking um, Indian officer in the field is Brigadier Timaya, and he's commanding at um, brigade level. And also, Brigadier Karyapa is, I think, he's the first to become a brigadier, and he he's involved in various important committees like the Wilcox Committee about the reorganisation reorganisation of the army which um, does a, repu- uh, a report in 1945. And even some of that is actually um, used, um, you know, post-47. So they're very important for the army um, of independent India and and and, um, uh, and even Pakistan as well. Although they have a lack of officers in the newly independent Pakistan army, and they're made up by, I think there is in, in, in 1947, there's about 500 British officers in the Pakistan army, which, um, you know, is, is, is never written about. And the first two, first two commander in chiefs of the Pakistan army is, I think, um, it's initially General Mesavi and then General Gracie takes over. And they're both of them had been divisional commanders in Burma. Um, so the first commander in chief of the Pakistan army from Pakistan is, I think, in the early fifties, but. I might have got that wrong. And Field Marshal Karyapa is the, or General Karyapa at the time, he he is the first commander in chief of the Indian Army round about, I think it's 1949. But obviously, without these officers already in place earlier on, you know, that wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been so easy. So, you know, it's very, the, the, the Indianization process, perhaps not so much, but um, certainly the officers during the Second World War are really important for the officers, for officering the Indian Army post nineteen forty seven. Yeah, I was, I was, I was just sat thinking. You reminded me that the Indian Army post war is not necessarily the Indian Army; it's obviously the Indian and the Pakistani Army. And I, I was sat thinking, I, I, I wonder if, uh, I wonder if there's something, you know, if you think of Gallipoli as defining features for the Dominion Armies during the, for the Australian. Australia as a nation building event and uh, obviously the, the, the Canadians can point to, to, to Vimy Ridge and there's sort of nothing for that of the Indian army coming necessarily, oh, maybe it's my ignorance, but on the international stage, but that could be because at the end of the second world war, India fractures. So there is no Indian army to point at. It's two distinct different countries. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. True. And also the, you know, then the nationalist narrative, of the 1940s is much more interested in the road to independence, Bengal famine and um, partition and independence. And then the, the, in 1947, 48, the, um, the, the fighting in Kashmir between Pakistan and um, India. So that's much more the historical narrative in India in the 1940s rather than compared to ours, which is obviously, you know, very much heavily dominated by the Second World War and you know, blitz spirit and, D Day, and you know, that comes around every anniversary. Indeed, with another raft of them this year. Alan, with the end of the war and independence looming, we'll leave it there. Now, listen, if you want to know more about how the Indian Army became such an effective fighting force, the book to read is Approach to Battle Training the Indian Army During the Second World War. Don't forget, this podcast is made possible with the contributions of listeners like yourself. If you have not already done so, why not sign up as a patron? at patreon.com slash ww2podcast. And I thank those of you who support the show. So that's patreon.com slash ww2podcast. Well that's all from me for now. I'm Angus Wallace and thanks for listening. Jerry A 
88 millimeter gun hit our tongue and blew us the hell out of it. The hell out of it. The hell out of it. Stalingrad can never be repaired. Be repaired. As Allied Commander-in-Chief, I have granted a military armistice. 